And then finally, last part. So other considerations in planning include uh, determining the need for experts. So we use a uh, PSA 620 using the work of an expert in this uh, particular area. So expert is a person or firm that possess a special skill, knowledge, and experience in a particular field other than highlight accounting and auditing. Okay, so examples of that would be engineers, lawyers, actuaries, okay, and uh, other professionals no, not involved in accounting and auditing. So experts may be engaged by uh, the client or even employed by the client or may be engaged or employed by the auditor. So however, uh, the situation, whether the expert is, uh, let's say, engaged or employed by the auditor or by the client would affect the auditor's evaluation of the work of the expert. Now, to continue with my example earlier, so these are some of uh, the areas you know, wherein the use of expert would be warranted. So we have a valuation of certain types of assets like real estate, fixed asset, jewelry. So those are done by a different professional, particularly appraisers. So another we have determination of quantities or physical condition of asset, such as uh, minerals stored in the stockpiles of uh, our client, underground mineral or per petroleum reserves. So those are normally performed by engineers no, rather than CPAs. So we have determination of amounts using a specialized techniques or method like actuarial valuation. So these are done by actuaries or mathematicians. So the measurement of work completed and to be completed by contracts in progress. So normally performed by engineers. And legal opinions concerning interpretations of agreement, statutes, and regulation normally performed by lawyers. Okay. However, whether we have to use an expert or not, so we have to consider the following factors. So the materiality of the financial statements in question. So for example, the client uh, has a jewelry, but the amount is not that material. No, they only have, let's say, one piece no, worth a certain amount of peso only. So therefore, it, uh, might, it not, might not be, or it might not be necessary to engage an expert in that particular area. Okay or the risk of material misstatement. So if that area would uh, prove to be a source of significant risk and the subject matter is complex, then we have to consider engaging an expert. So otherwise, it might not also be necessary. And the quantity and quality of other audit evidence available. So for example, in appraising land. So if that land is located in an area where in uh, published price quotation exists, so we might not need an expert for that area. So compared to, uh, let's say, land located in, uh, in a remote area, so wherein the valuation cannot be readily determined, so therefore there's no other evidence but to engage an appraiser. So these are the considerations that we have to consider before engaging an expert. And then finally, with respect to the work of the expert, we also have to consider their competence and objectivity so meaning when uh, someone represents himself to be an engineer, so we have to confirm whether that person is really an engineer. So we have to look at his or her qualification, so professional license, no, past work, and experience in determining whether their work would be useful in our own engagement. And also their objectivity. So whether, let's say, they are engaged by the client or not, engaged by the auditor or not. So this one we have mentioned. So professional certification and membership and professional organization, we have to consider. So the experience and reputation and even his or her objectivity. Okay. Now, there is a higher risk of impaired objectivity on the part of the expert in case they are employed by the entity or they are not independent in relation to the entity, for example, employed by their related party. So that is why if we are not satisfied with the work of the expert, we have to discuss that with the client. Okay, if we have reservation about the competence or objectivity of the expert. So because uh, let's say if uh, the work of that particular expert is uh, not acceptable to us, so then we have to perform additional audit procedures and even engage our own expert to satisfy our, to satisfy our uh, need no? or our satisfaction, to satisfy our requirement 
in uh, auditing that particular area. Okay? And then finally, even if we have involved an expert, we do not rely on the work of the expert without validating their inputs. So we know that how that area is assessed is outside of our, uh, let's say, discipline or knowledge or skill, but we still have to assess whether their work fit no, the requirement in a performed procedure in that particular area. So we may not be able to replicate the computation that they made, but we can consider whether the inputs that they use are appropriate. So we can check whether the inputs are appropriate okay, as far as uh, that uh, particular area is concerned. So let's say an actuary has uh, measured the uh, employment benefit plan of uh, our client. So they use a certain data like a number of uh, personnel employed by the entity. So we have to compare that with the actual data from the payroll department of our client, whether they have used the correct number of uh, personnel and correct uh, salary of the personnel. So we have to evaluate the work of the expert. Okay. So whether the assumptions made are reasonable and even the consistency of uh, the method that they they have used. And uh, we can relate the output of the expert based on our overall knowledge of the client's business and operation. And finally, if we are concerned about the competence or objectivity of the expert, as mentioned earlier, so we have to discuss that with management. So we may perform our additional audit procedures or even seek evidence from another expert. Okay, so because uh, otherwise, if the client will not permit us, so that would involve no scope limitation that could affect our opinion. Okay, so on that particular area of the financial statements of our client. And then finally, the last part of our planning phase is the development of the overall audit strategy and the more detailed audit plan. So remember, in the start of our discussion, when we say audit strategy, so this uh, sets the scope, timing, and direction of the audit. So it sets the characteristics of the engagement, our reporting objectives, and important factors that we have to consider. Like for example, earlier, the significant risk, the need for experts. So we have to consider them in, uh, in uh, preparing our overall audit strategy. In contrast, the detailed audit plan so addresses a specific matters identified in our overall audit strategy. Now, the preparation of the overall audit strategy and the detailed audit plan are not distinct or separate step in audit. So normally they overlap, no? They overlap with each other and not necessarily sequential in process as mentioned earlier. And finally, our detailed audit plan will include the description of the specific procedures that we will perform. Now, like for example, the risk assessment procedures that we will be performing the additional audit procedures or the further audit procedures that we will perform that we will be performing and other planned audit procedures so that is why at uh, the end of our preparation of the detailed audit plan we will come up with what we call an audit program so the audit program is uh, the list of procedures that we will be using in gathering sufficient and appropriate audit evidence so we will be having an audit program relating to performance of a uh, Test of controls and substantive audit procedures, so which are part of our further audit procedures. So this document will be useful uh, for all the team members, particularly for the audit staff who will be performing the detailed audit procedures. So because here they will have a guide what will be the specific step or procedure in uh, performing a specific audit uh, procedures such as test of control or substantive test. So we also have to consider the timing of our audit work. So considering that not all the work are done at period end. So some of the audit work can be done prior to year end, like for example, study and evaluation of internal control. So we have to incorporate that also in our overall audit strategy. So if there are Procedures that will be performed before the year end, we call that uh, interim procedure or procedures done during the interim period. So therefore, we have to prepare an audit timetable 
that we should agree uh, that we should have to agree with the management or with the client okay so because uh, some procedures require the participation or cooperation of the client and we cannot just proceed with that without the cooperation of the client so case in point uh, observation of the physical inventory so the observation of physical inventory the schedule the procedure should be closely coordinated with the client so therefore we have to we have to discuss with them so the audit timetable so that both parties will uh, not have a misunderstanding or conflict with respect to the performance of audit procedures usually this is being done during the preliminary conference with the client or the planning meeting with the management okay so however not all aspects of our plan should be divulged to the client to preserve at the end of the day uh, the unpredictability of our audit procedures. Okay, so because if you will uh, share with the client all the specific procedure samples that we will be using, then the element of a surprise would uh, not be there anymore, which uh, would enable the client to prepare for the procedures that we might be performing. So we have to consider that also. Finally, some final considerations in our overall audit strategy include uh, the use of the assistance of the company's uh, personnel, like for example, during the observation of physical count. So we will be needing uh, the assistance of their uh, accounting and finance personnel, personnel from their warehouse, so in conducting the count. So we have to incorporate that also in our strategy and in our discussion with the client. So the work of uh, internal auditors, if uh, we need, for example, to rely on the internal controls of the client, so we may uh, cooperate with uh, the internal auditors to help us assess the controls of the client. So work of other auditors in case the client is, uh, let's say, a group of company. So there will be a reporting requirement from the other auditors let's say, auditor of the subsidiary or component of the client. So we also have to consider that in our overall audit strategy. And also, if the client employs service organization like business process outsourcing companies, so in that case, we have to consider also the impact in our audit. So let's say the payroll of the client is being handled by another company. So that is an example of service organization. So we have to consider that also. So we'll discuss this uh, in detail when uh, we discuss audit report. So the impact or in even in uh, the performance of detailed audit procedures. So what would be the impact of uh, this uh, other person in our audit engagement? Okay, so at this point, we're done with a discussion of the planning consideration.